Star Wars 7 by 7 episode 3026. It's the second half of my conversation with Chris Kemshaw, the author of The History and Politics of Star Wars, about the history and politics of the Andor series to date. Punch it! Hey Rebel Rouser, I'm Alan Voivod and this is Star Wars 7x7, your daily dose of Star Wars joy. And thank you so much for joining me for it. So here again is the official bit about Chris Kemshaw. Chris is a postdoctoral research fellow at the University of Exeter and a senior research fellow at the Center for Army Leadership, Royal Military Academy Sandhurst. He is a historian of the First World War as well as popular representations of history in modern media. He has authored numerous academic works including the First World War in computer games and British, French, and American relations on the Western Front 1914 to 1918, and of course the history and politics of Star Wars earlier this year. And as I mentioned on yesterday's episode, Chris was kind enough to share a 25% discount code with us. And so that is on the blog post for this show's episode at sw7x7.com and in the show notes as well, along with a link to where you can pick that up. And as for the conversation itself, well, as I said on yesterday's episode, it covers a broad range of topics, including his reactions to Andor, both as a fan and as a historian, what he's seeing about the Empire and how it's depicted in the Andor series, as well as the Preox Corlana, uh, Morlana Corporate Authority, and just got my consonants mixed up there for a second. Also, the rebellion, the burgeoning rebellion as it's being formed, and that brilliant monologue from Nemec that is just enough, just enough to reflect on our contemporary politics. Also, a discussion for our mutual dislike for Perrin and our appreciation for Alistair McKenzie for his performance in the role of the person you love to hate, as well as some speculation about where the Andor series is potentially going. And I was really surprised by the thing that he pulled Chris did for this and I think he's got you know a really interesting idea for it so without further ado here is the second half of my conversation with historian Chris Kemshall about the Andor series so far and I wonder also about Mon Mothma and Luthen Rail and whether their paths are about to diverge now that Luthen has his own source of money and he's not having to look for Mon Mothma to fund his operations I wonder if that means that he's about to go you know his his own separate way and possibly even you know that that road leads to Saw Gerrera and the divergence between Mon Mothma's methods and Saw Gerrera's methods that you know becomes more formal a couple of years down the line yeah I I was going to say that I could see Luther ending up as somewhere at, at, heading towards the middle point of Mon Mothma and Saw Gerrera on the like the the rebel alliance mm. political spectrum um where you know Saw Gerrera as we know from appearances in Rebels and Rogue One is more than happy to fight this war in whatever manner he sees fit and Mothma, Mon Mothma is not willing to do that certainly not at this point in time um, and if we get to a point when, you know, there are reprisals and there are you know, killings and there are massacres, Luthen and Andor, you know, effectively have a choice, you know, if Andor's going to, you know, throw himself in with the rebellion, which we know that he will do, um, is, you know, how are you going to fight this war? You know, we know from when Saw Guerrero appears in Rebels and he has this kind of amazing um, hologram conversation debate with Mon Mothma where he says, if you continue to fight this war in the Empire's terms, you are going to lose. Um, mm -hmm. Is is Luthen going to decide that you know the diplomatic, gently, gently, let's you know just have a couple of bank heists and we'll you know drain a little bit of the money away from the Empire and we'll do it that way? Is that the way to win a war? Or if you're going to fight a war, are you going to are you going to have to fight it? Are, you know, are you going to use this money to finance rebel cells? Are you going to use it to buy weapons? Are you going to use it to do things with? Because it's not entirely clear what Mothma is planning on spending the money on that he was trying to kind of gather up for, for Luthen. Is it, you know, some kind of sophisticated leaflet campaign? Um, or <laughs> is, is he planning on buying a bunch of guns? Um, and... You know, that's not to say that Mon Mothma is wrong and Saw Gerrera is right, but, you know, these are the, the different political viewpoints that are existing in this kind of nascent rebel alliance. And it's going to be very, very interesting to see which kind of sides of the spectrum these characters fall, particularly after Cassian has, you know, a, the prolonged conversation about um, the role of mercenaries in, um, yeah, in the rebel yeah. alliance. Um, you know, 
at the moment he's a mercenary at what point does he become an ideologue um it might be after reading this manifesto <laughs> yes <laughs> which i hope gets released as a book at some point too because oh, i think that would great, be wouldn't it yes oh yeah it would be fantastic i i hope they've planned that far ahead <laughs> for this and i think mon mothma is also going to get tested in terms of you know the levels at which he can accept political violence i mean she has been i guess for a pacifist from the jump certainly from the clone wars situation and in other star wars storytelling she and padme have had their disagreements because of the whole aggressive negotiations thing and i think it was um in the in the last novel of ek johnston's padme trilogy that came out last year they get into a brief argument where padme basically says look if you didn't expect aggressive negotiations to happen you shouldn't have sent me because that's what's going to happen when i go there and so you know she has to go okay yeah point taken uh but she has to be moving further along in the spectrum and it seems like with her conversations with luthan is trying to keep herself at least removed from knowing actually what's happening even though she understands that she has you know political danger for herself if they're caught doing what they're doing yeah um and the danger to one mothma is not the same as the danger for people like andor who are out on the front line but she's making it clear that, you know she is being spied upon constantly the empire has kind of you know infected every aspect of the world around her um as as she's viewed as a kind of a a dubious actor um and you know at some point clearly you know as we see it as, as rogue one um mon mothma reaches the point of saying you know the only way this is going to be resolved is through warfare um so kind of seeing those those early steps towards that at the moment i will say that um if it took that long for for mon mothma to kind of um shed her kind of ex kind of more kind of absolutist pacifism um by rogue one then her husband might, should consider himself to be a very lucky man because i'd have killed him years ago um, <laughs> if I was with him. um god that's just an awful awful man i hate him um, uh, so first let's let's give um uh, i i do want to do this because i i mentioned him a few times in episodes and didn't name the actor when i was doing it i felt badly alistair mckenzie i think is the, this the name of the gentleman who plays heron and i i i do want to say you know, how you know thrilled i am with him because he has created the character that i love to hate the most <laughs> the most oh it's oh. a great portrayal it really is but i do hate him yes and i i just you know i want to like sit down with mon and go how did this happen how did you, you end better. up how oh oh yeah. gosh you deserve to be happy mon this isn't this isn't the life that we wanted for you um yes. somebody inviting over genuinely the worst people imaginable for dinner um mm -hmm. go oh you know you because they're was, fun because they're fun like i i saw some of those in the in the opera scene at revenge of the sith those people did not look like they were fun um <laughs> i wouldn't want them in my house um and oh. come over for for dinner it's like oh you know what you know my mothma's got a got a busy time um you know trying to trying to do the things and 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 you know be a pacifist and and help with all of these these problems how about if i gather up just absolute garbage people and bring them into our house for her when she gets home um wouldn't that wouldn't Ugh. that be a trick uh, you know what she's gonna enjoy it so much i'm not even gonna tell her um we'll just we'll just <laughs> find out when she gets home it's like oh surprise surprise the emperor's friends are coming to dinner won't that be a delight oh uh, oh uh, i they're mean fun. and fun Oh, and I thought it couldn't, you know, get worse than that. But then the next episode where he's just completely undermining her as oh. a mother and a parent. I mean, just the the looks that he's giving the daughter and kind of like encouraging her to you know be as you know difficult and and obnoxious to her mother as possible and not even supporting her at all, not providing any kind of united front. Oh my gosh. Oh, oh you also end up with this really interesting view of Mon Mothma coming from her daughter of basically careerist politician who's in it for the publicity. Um, mm -hmm. And, you know, obviously there's an element of that's a role that she has to play in order to not get picked up by the emperor's goons. But it, 
what we know of Mum Mothma, that's not who she is. You know, she is right. a she is a she, she is an idealist. Um, and to have that view of her, you know, there's an element of like you can almost understand it coming from a child who feels like they've been neglected by somebody who is, you know, very visibly in the public eye. And whilst I don't like it, you can kind of understand, you know, children have a view of their parents. But that asshole sat on the other side of the table. You, sir, have crossed the line. <laughs> sat there with your yes. knowing side eye glances and your stupid haircut. <laughs> and he is contributing to that. I mean, if he were, ha- it seems like he and the daughter have a decent relationship, you know, as yeah. decent as these things go. But he could be using that relationship to be supportive of Mon and say to the daughter, you know, Lita, uh, Lita, um, you know, hey, like she's got other things going on. She does care about you. You know, they're, yeah, but obviously Mon can't even share with him some of the stuff that she's doing because he clearly wants to have fun with all the bad guys. And why yeah. does everything have to be so, you know, boring and sad? Like that's his complaint. And it, it's, uh. it's, a, it's such a, and again, this is, this is 100% a political commentary of, you know, I don't think it's necessarily uh, a shock that the, you know, the, the wealthy white guy um, in a position of privilege and comfort is the one go, why does everything have to be about politics? Why can't things just be fun? <laughs> You're always concerned about these work things and these people getting killed and stuff like that. Can't we just have dinner and turn the news off? It's like, well, firstly, shut up. But secondly, have you, have you <laughs> looked at the world outside? The, 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 mm-hmm. the absolute kind of crushing sense of comfort that you must exist in to be able to go, honestly, just turn the news off. There's only so many massacres that I can that I can bother paying attention to. And it's the other side of that. The pace of oppression is outstripping our ability to accept it or, or to deal with it. In that, you know, you have certain characters who are going, this is happening too much. This is happening too quickly. We need to try and find a way to deal with this. And then you get Perrin going, mm-hmm. oh, I'm just, I'm just disengaged. It's just boring background noise now. I, I want to have a dinner party. Oh, oh, I honestly would rather go to dinner with the emperor than go to dinner with Perrin. <laughs> because at least, you know, I was, I, I was moaning, I, me and Kristen Baver have been, have been joking about Perrin. Um, I think, you know, at least Palpatine is charismatic and charming and probably can tell an anecdote. Perry yes. is just awful. Um, and, you know, he's invited, you know, I keep saying he's invited these awful people to dinner, but at least once he's invited those awful people to dinner, they're going to leave. Perrin's going to stay. He's going to continue uh, uh, living in your house. So do you, th- what do you think happens to him and their daughter by the time of Rogue One. I mean, obviously, just because they're not in the movie, that doesn't mean, you know, the worst has happened, they're dead. Like, they're just not there. And we know that Mon is officially on the run and, you know, on the most wanted list as of, I think, 2 BBY, if I remember my dates. But, I mean, I can't imagine a world where Perrin is like, yeah, Mon, let's you know, go on the lamb and I'm here for you and I'm supporting this rebellion. Like, yeah, that's I've always wanted how... to live out of a suitcase. <sighs> right. That's not how this is going to go. So what is going to happen? Ah, oh. yeah, that I don't know, <laughs> because, you know, you can start ticking off the options, you know, rounded up and killed, giving one more, more an additional kind of motivator to overthrow the empire. But I, I don't like that for a couple of reasons. Firstly, I don't think her daughter deserves to die. No, Perrin can. No. Parent can make his own bed. Um, yep. <laughs> but also, yep. I I prefer the idea that Mon Mothma is doing all of this out of idealism and ideology. It's it's too yeah. much of a trope at times, I think, of, oh, the Empire killed my family, and then I realised that they were bad. It's like, well, did you not notice about the family next door when they got killed? Um, right. mm-hmm. And so I wonder if the kind of the realistic aspect of this is either knowingly as a kind of a we're going to play this role is that they basically kind of um what's the word i'm looking for um detach themselves from mom mothma and say you know she is you know a wild extremist we have no interest in her we are loyal imperial citizens and we're gonna you know you're gonna keep us alive because of the propaganda benefits of having her daughter and her husband say she's a rogue you know, kind of um, mm-hmm. fanaticist um, stirring up trouble. Now, I could imagine the daughter just being like, okay, we're going to play this role because, you know, I don't want to get killed. Um, and maybe Perrin will show a depth of humanity that 
as of yet remains untapped but that's kind of what <laughs> i'm hoping that 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 mm-hmm. nothing serious happens to them because i think it's more interesting if it doesn't and at some point you know a decision has to be made whether to disavow yourself of Mon Mothra and the rebel alliance ideology or go actually i quite like the empire um, and, you know, mm-hmm. that becomes a, a more difficult thing for Mon Mothma to get over than just, oh, you know, stormtroopers came up and they shot everybody. I I agree with you on that. I think, yeah, it is too much of a trope to have them, you know, be sacrificed at the at the hands of the Empire. And it definitely offers more opportunity for, for chaos and also for more, like, gnashing of teeth and, yeah. like, clawing of hands with whatever parents' antics are going to be next. Ugh goodness <laughs> all right um you've been so generous with your time chris are, oh, are there any you. final oh absolutely and it's a joy to talk to you and do you have any final thoughts about Andor so far as it's been that you that you'd like to share um there's there's a couple of things that i've noticed that i found super interesting and i've, I've kind of i've talked about a few of these on kind of on kind of twitter is the extent to which things are being made scarier in Andor than have previously been. TIE fighters are scary in Andor. Uh, They're not mm -hmm. scary in Star Wars films because they're made of cardboard and they blow up and everyone gets away. But just having that, you know, just a lone TIE fighter screaming down a valley and everybody kind of covering up the weapons and that's that that kind of uh, the sound that a TIE fighter's made, which is taken from the Jericho siren of um, Stuka dive bombers in the Second World War. They feel Uh. scary. Um, They're designed Mm -hmm. to be scary. Um, And I find that really interesting the the way that because we're so grassroots you know it's it's five people pulling a bank heist the arrival of a tie fighter at the wrong time is going to wipe out your rebel cell you know you're not mm-hmm. going to get a lightsaber out and bat away with a light you know with a blast and you're not going to shoot it. it you're just going to get killed um and i i find that element that they're doing of because they're so close to the ground any imperial involvement is scary the empire is scarier in and or than i think it's been in a lot of other kind of star wars media and star wars shows which i like mm-hmm. um and a slightly more kind of uh light-hearted element because Andor seemingly was filmed a lot in the uk um in in studios over here quite a lot of the actors around it are are british actors that are recognizable from other tv shows including quite a lot of soap operas um ah. that have appeared so you know the um the the like the security guard the, the the scottish guy who convinces um oh, what's the what's the name of um who convinces cyril to kind of go down to ferrix and and take him over um yeah so linus i think linus yeah mosque yes something like that he, he was like in a in a uk soap like 10 15 years ago he's like oh, oh okay you, you used to be in that show and now you're you're now you're a space fascist okay that's fine <laughs> um but it, it adds in like a, a like a weird element that probably isn't doesn't exist for the um for the like the american audience of going i know you from somewhere what are you doing here um right but the the character who i think interestingly to end on is probably cyril khan himself um mm-hmm. this this kind of interesting character and i've seen people on on twitter having really interesting discussions and threads saying you know there's an element of he is the mirror opposite of andor of cassian himself at the moment you know both have got kind of slightly weird family situations both feel abandoned both kind of looking for for something to do and andor is headed towards rebellion and cyril is headed towards the empire but what i find interesting about cyril is that I spoke in the book a little bit of the empire being the preserve at times of petty fascists, you know, deeply mediocre men with delusions of grandeur. Mm-hmm. And it's hard not to look at him and go, you are a petty fascist because he has <laughs> these, you know, he gets, you know, expressly told, do not go and do this thing. You're going to annoy the empire. That's going to cause us a problem. But then the tempting power thing glistens in front of him. So he goes off and, and does it. And he talks you know, passionately about, you know, we have to do this, we have to, you know, show that you can't do these to our people, and, you know, two guys got killed, but when he gets his moment with all of those security guys to kind of give them a rousing speech, he's got nothing, he doesn't have, he doesn't have it in him, because he, right, there's no charisma, there's no, there's no burning element in there to motivate people, what he wants them to recognise is the opportunity of the power, and he could have said, you know, 
take this as an example. If you ever end up face down in an alleyway, I will make sure that me and all of these guys are going to come and avenge you. And that's how you motivate a bunch of people to go out and do this thing. Go, you know, I we're not going to allow this to happen to them because I'm not going to allow this to happen to you. And instead, it's just kind of, yeah, it's nice you came along. Let's let's go do a thing. Um, <laughs> and what you end up with on on the planet is again it's it's a it's a comment on particular films but it's also a comment on a wider movement of you know a police force that comes down and just starts brutalizing people you know i don't think again in 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 a kind of a, a black lives matter era i don't think it's a coincidence that a bunch of guys with guns in blue uniforms just shot someone who was trying to you know rescue his wife who was being beaten up um mm -hmm. and you end up with the the final bit where they're all on these rooftops and they're gonna you know make sure that the, the speed up car doesn't doesn't do anything and and then um the guy in charge who i'm going to refer to as trevor because that's his name in the soap opera that he was in. <laughs> <laughs> um trevor, there's, there's these explosions and like and he looks around and goes we're under siege Go, but you shouldn't even be here You've landed mm. on a planet that isn't yours. You're enforcing law upon them. And what I ended up thinking about was the film Black Hawk Down. Um, oh. Of, you know, you, your, your helicopter's crashed and you're surrounded by all these people who don't want you here. And they go, oh my God, we're under attack. It's like, well, what are you doing there? It's, mm -hmm. it's that element. They've inserted themselves into this, onto the planet of Ferrix. And now that people are pushing back, going, oh my God, we're under attack. We, you know, we're under siege. We have to do something. And it's that, that mindset of, but if you hadn't come, you you wouldn't be in this situation. And for you now to basically assume that you are under siege because people are rejecting your presence is a really interesting commentary on, you know, historical colonialism. And, you know, it's, it's 100 percent, you know, any number of examples through the British Empire of people, you know, Britain turning up in somebody else's country, sticking a flag in the ground and people going, yeah, we're not keen on this. Go, whoa, 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 whoa. You don't need to start, you know, getting angry and starting throwing, you know, swords and guns and that about you know i'm feeling very attacked right now that kind of colonial reflex to being rejected um is super interesting and it's it's kind of exactly the type of thing that i was hoping for in elements but the realization of it on the screen is is fascinating to me and i am getting a huge kick out of it that's awesome. I am so glad you're enjoying it. And you have you know, a level of experience and scholarship that allows you the potential to experience it on yet another level. And I'm <laughs> especially grateful for the fact that you're able to enjoy it on that level as well. For people who are hearing a conversation between us for the first time or are not familiar with you and want to learn more about your writing and your and your background and your books where should people keep up with you um so i mean you know if, if you've been in you know sitting along here going you know this is a level of analysis of a star wars show that i don't need in my life you can get more <laughs> of it um on you know on twitter um at chris kempshaw um where i will continue you know within the confines of not giving spoilers away to overanalyze um something that i love um presumably for the rest of time um if you want to kind of read some of the things um, that have kind of informed my kind of thought process of, of, of Star Wars and the like, but is now also annoyingly slightly outdated because of Andor, um, you can get my book, um, which is called The History and Politics of Star Wars, uh, Death Stars and Democracy. I'll, similar to last time, I'll give you a 25% a, a discount code. We can put them in, if you want to put them in the show notes where people can still yes. make use of it and get it and get the book for a bit cheaper. Um, then yeah, you know, that's kind of my my foundation level of, you know, how do we understand and place Star Wars in a historical, political um, framework? And pleasingly, whilst, you know, I joke about the book being outdated, um, what's helpful is, and always not diverging from the model that I kind of suggested existed in the books, if they had massively contradicted it, this would be a lot more awkward um, than, than, <laughs> than it is. Um, so yeah, I, I still think that Andor plays very nicely alongside the book, but then I would say that because I want people to buy and read and enjoy, <laughs> enjoy the book. Um, so yeah, those are, those are good places. You know, if you like in-universe Star Wars stuff, I did um, 
I co-wrote with Jason Fry and Amy Radcliffe and Cole Horton the book um, Star Wars Battles that Changed the Galaxy, uh, which does Star Wars battles and Star Wars military stuff and strategy. And, and that's a that's a fun read as well. So by I don't have a I don't have a discount code for that, unfortunately, <laughs> but um, I imagine you can find it from places that sell books. I imagine so as well. And I'll look to find those and link it. I will link all of this at the blog post for the show's episode at SW7X7.com and in the show notes as well. And I'll get that coupon code from you after we wrap this up. I'll make sure that appears there too. The always charmingly self-deprecating Chris Kempshaw. <laughs> Thank you so much for your time and for joining me for a very fun discussion. I really appreciate it. Thank you for having me and, and enjoy everybody and continue enjoying Andor. There's, there's, there's loads more to come. And there you go. That does it for my most recent conversation with Chris Kemshaw, the author of The History and Politics of Star Wars. And that also does it for this episode of the podcast. It just remains for me to say thank you so much for joining me for it as always. And may the force be with you wherever in the world you may be. Seven by Seven is not endorsed or sponsored yet by Lucasfilm Limited, Disney, or 20th Century Fox, and is intended for entertainment and information purposes only. Star Wars, the Star Wars logo, all names and pictures of Star Wars characters, vehicles, and any other Star Wars related items are registered trademarks and or copyrights of Lucasfilm Limited, by their respective trademark and copyright holders. May the force be with them. All original content is copyright 2021 by Star Wars 7x7. We hope you love it.